A band of white men came to the Rocky Mountains in the 1820s, not to settle the land, but to harvest its riches. They were capitalists, adventurers, or simply hired help. Within 20 years of their arrival, most of them had disappeared. The focus of their enterprise was the pelt of the North American beaver. The result was, I guess you might say, a presence in our imaginations that remains undiminished to this day. We call them mountain men. Why come to the mountains and risk one's life being caught by the Etsina? Going down into a willow grove to set some traps in a stream and there being uh, mauled and killed by a grizzly bear. It was a very dangerous life. You know, the mountain men had three great enemies. One was the, some of the Indians who were their enemies, the other being the grizzly bear, and the third being Mother Nature. Who knows how many mountain men died on some unknown named stream or some lonely place of pneumonia, wading into these cold pools of water and streams, uh, getting sick and dying. We have no idea how many men whose names we'll never know died out in the wilderness trying to bring in beaver, trying to make a, a living, having a dream and becoming rich in one or two seasons of trapping and yet losing their lives. It was not an easy life, it was a hard life. The mountain men lived lives of perilous and daring adventure. These men included popular legends such as Jim Bridger, Thomas Fitzpatrick, and Jedediah Smith. But what kind of men were these mountain men? And what brought them to the Rocky Mountains? To understand all of this, we need to first understand the beaver trade. And they were after beaver for one reason, and that is there was a demand for beaver to make hats. The carriage trade had made it very clear that the fashions of the day included the hat that was made out of the skin of the beaver. Not only the skin of the beaver to make the hat, but to make the cufflings, to coats, to make blankets that were used in the carriages. Time really hasn't changed that much. Uh, it seems like the wealthy are the ones that set the fashion trends, and it was no different back in the early 1800s. Prior to 1825, the bulk of the beaver pelts had been supplied from trading posts on the upper Missouri River. The first traders depended on tribes of Indians to trap the beaver in exchange for blankets and trinkets, food supplies, and weapons. Keelboats plied the river, taking supplies to the trading posts and delivering the pelts down to St. Louis headquarters for the major fur companies. A combination of opportunity and circumstance changed all of that because, well, the price of the beaver pelts was increasing. William Ashley, who would later become a United States Senator, advertised for a hundred men to establish new trading posts farther up the river in the Rockies. This mountain wilderness was not unknown. Ever since the Lewis and Clark expedition, men were aware of vast reaches of land beyond the mountains land rich with beaver. But Ashley ran into bad luck right away. One of his first boats went up the river and wrecked with a loss of $10,000 worth of goods. The following spring, 1823, Ashley sent up two more boats, but this time the problem was the Arikara Indians. 15 men were killed in a brief but heated battle that forced the survivors back down the river. Deeply in debt and with hostile Indians on the Missouri, Ashley decided to send 11 of his remaining men, led by Jedediah Smith, overland to the mountains farther west. The group wintered with Crow Indians on the Wind River before crossing South Pass into the Green River Valley. The predominant Indian in this uh, particular part of the country was the Crow Indians. They gave it the name Wind River uh, from their own tongue. It meant uh, translated from their tongue into the uh, Wind Shrill River, which because of the winds that blow down through this country, uh, that's how they interpreted it. This is a unique uh, geographical spot in that uh, this area forms three of the major river drainages in the western United States. 
There are three rivers that flow out of here, and those three rivers flow to different parts of the world. Uh, one flows out to the Pacific Ocean eventually, one flows into the Gulf of California, and one flows into the Gulf of Mexico. But it was Jedediah Smith who camped with the Mountain Crow down in Du Bois, Wyoming, uh, learned of the uh, passes of Togedi Pass, of Union Pass, and of South Pass. And uh, Jedediah Smith was the one who rediscovered South Pass, uh, which later became the major route for the Oregon, Mormon, and California trails uh, through the Rocky Mountains. The Indians told Jed Smith about a pass that took them south of the Great Wind River mountain range. Of course, today we know this as the famous South Pass. In the spring of 1824, these men, representing Ashley, went into the Green River Basin. They found there a bonanza of beaver, and this was the origin of the mountain man. The beaver hunt was seasonal. Trappers worked down the mountain streams in the fall until the waters froze and wouldn't return for another four to six months with the spring thaw. This is a reproduction of an original 1825 beaver trap. It's all hand forged, done by a blacksmith. To set these, you Flip the dog back, pan up on the dog, let go. Always keep your fingers underneath so you don't get them caught. That's a trap, set trap there. Beaver comes in, steps on the pan, caught. When we start thinking about tools, the knife has got to be uh, an integral part of the trapper's gear. The most prevalent knife is the, is the butcher knife or skinning knife. Um, these are both uh, originals of Sheffield, England, uh, I. Wilson Company. These were brought over by the hundreds of thousands and traded, a lot of times with wooden handles, sometimes just the blade. Um, but five pins, you see the two pins here and the center pin, two more pins here, holding on the wood scales. Also, you'll notice that sometimes the blade is tapered. It's only a half, a half tang, and sometimes it's a full tang, coming all the way back. Also, a period correct knife would be tapered from the hilt forward to the point, and also from the hilt back, it would gradually taper as these both do. This one coming back to about here, this one coming full tang. Uh, the butcher knife, definitely the most feasible. Uh, that's what you're doing. You're butchering hides, you're skinning beaver. After the beaver have been trapped and taken back to camp, we uh, flesh them, stretch them on a hooped willow. Nose to tail, fill in the sides, fleshed clean, and then stretched to dry. After the beaver have been dried, then they're folded in half, hair end, and ready to be pressed and packed. And they'll be enclosed in canvas for dryness and so that the, the fur won't get wet and then we'll wrap them and tie them ready for packing on a mule to carry on to rendezvous. The hides are laid in alternately first side against first side and staggered to make an even package. Okay this looks like it'll make a load Tom. That's a good looking load. Pete. Okay well, that's pretty snug there. Okay I'm going to go ahead and fold the back end, Tom. We'll pull it and rope it out there. Okay, got her? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty tight. Time to get that other rope on, I think we'll have her. Go ahead and get the other rope and I'll, I'll hold this down. Now the packed hides would be between 70 and 100 pounds because that would fit on one side of a mule. So hopefully we won't have to unpack this, uh, but if they do get wet, we'll have to unpack them, open them up, air them, and repack them. But this fur press is the, actually the easiest way out here to get a good tight load. Winter brought an awesome silence to the mountains. This was the time when nature revealed her severest character, when the mountain men were unable to trap the frozen streams and beavers were in hibernation. This was a time of survival. Now was the time to leave the trapping and make way to a lower valley to prepare for winter quarters. 
There, sometimes hundreds of mountain men would choose the same area to wait, tell tales, and refurbish their gear. But this is really how your mountain men spent their winters. They would spend long, idle hours mending clothes, mending pack saddles, talking to each other. And you can just imagine how many nights must have been spent sitting around the campfire where one person would get up and share his stories and his experiences and you know never letting the truth get in the way of telling a good story. But how many hours must have been told recounting the geography of the American West, telling them where they had been, new places they had found, prime beaver trapping location. You can also imagine how many hours must have been spent talking about fights with Blackfeet, talking about home. In fact, there were even occasions where the mountain men had books. And so often we have this image of mountain men as being illiterate, as being really exiles from society. And surely that was the case with some, but not all of the mountain men were fleeing from the law. Many of them came to the West fully educated, literate, and even some brought books. One trapper even went so far to call some of these long winter nights as the Rocky Mountain School. It was a time when they would get together and, and some of the literate men would actually read. And then, in fact, their stories of reading Shakespeare, reading the Bible, sitting around camp at a mountain man campfire. And some, even like Joe Meek, learned to read one winter. With the trapping completed, it was necessary to get the furs back to St. Louis and to replenish his goods and equipment for the coming trapping season. Ashley introduced the rendezvous system to accommodate this need, enabling trappers to remain in the mountains year-round. The two most important features of a rendezvous site were abundant forage and water. The first rendezvous in 1825 took place on a grassy plain near the Utah-Wyoming border along Henry's Fork, a tributary of the Green River. It lasted only a day. It was unique because, well, Ashley didn't bring any liquor. He corrected this the next year, and after the 1826 rendezvous, sold his company to some of his trappers. The rendezvous which followed stretched into weeks, weeks filled with trading and outfitting, drinking, games, tall tales, and news. This larger-than-life behavior is what the reputation of the mountain man is built on. Rendezvous of 1825, there was approximately 150 people at the rendezvous. The rendezvous in 1832, there were upwards to five or 600 men out of St. Louis, some of them suppliers, others mountain men, and upwards to two to 3,000 Indians, Indians such as the Flathead, Indians like the Nez Perce, uh, Indians Shoshone, Crow, uh, Ute Indians. This became a very, very important thing in the 1830s. And uh, it was at that time that these huge rendezvous would take place. The bearded mountain man was the creation of artists who came later. Frederick Remington painted 50 years after the close of the era. Alfred Jacob Miller, an artist who actually attended rendezvous, depicted men with small beards or none at all. Beards were not in fashion at the time, and they were added to our myth of the mountain man to make him appear maybe a little more colorful and a little less civilized than he really was. If a mountain man wanted an Indian bride, you can bet your bottom dollar he was clean shaven. Even when they intermarried with Indian wives, I think they still preferred to keep their identity, you know. And there was no real stigma associated with an Indian woman marrying uh, a white man. And, because it generally melt, uh, meant, you know, wealth and goodness for her family because she was going to be able to uh, have direct contact and, uh, you know, being on the loop of the trade goods and the direct the line to the trade goods. By the time the rendezvous ended and the mountain man returned to the mountains, autumn was coming. The yearly cycle was about to begin again, a cycle that would repeat for the mountain man 16 times. But it ended. It ended basically, ironically, because of a fashion trend. They went from the beaver to the silk hat. And when that happened, that great era in American history came to an end. As one great era died, an era of the fur trade, that period from 1824, 25 up to 1840, another was ready to take its place. 
and this was the era of the Great Western Migration. Most historians will say the fur trade ended in 1840, and those same historians would say the first real migration westward was in 1842-43. And many of these men who had spent many years in the mountains, these were the men that became the scouts, the guides for the overland migration, for military expeditions, for government expeditions of groups that were sent out to map and to chart the American West. Situated in the heart of rendezvous country is Pinedale, Wyoming, home of the Museum of the Mountain Man. This museum presents a visual and interpretive experience in the Romantic era of the Mountain Man. It also provides a comprehensive overview of the fur trade's historical significance to the Western expansion. This is the center of the fur trade because Sublette County boasts six of the 16 original rendezvous and Wyoming boasts 10 of the original 16 rendezvous. So in our little valley we have a rich history and a tradition of, of values as to what opened up the West and how the Oregon Trail and the migration to the West Coast happened. The museum is operated by the Sublette County Historical Society, the oldest society in the state of Wyoming. In 1936, a small group of locals started this society to save the artifacts and history of the area. They reenacted the 1835 Green River Rendezvous for a hundred year commemoration. From there, it grew into a dream and a vision of building the museum. Money was raised for decades and in 1974, they broke ground on donated land. It was a labor of love. The museum first opened in 1990 and since then, has grown into a world-class destination for visitors wanting to learn more about the mountain man and his importance to the American West. The museum displays begin by explaining the early exploration of Lewis and Clark and how it evolved into the fur trade. Numerous artifacts and exhibits portray the history and background. Artifacts include Jim Bridger's rifle given to him by Luis Vasquez in 1853. The museum is also home to one of the very few sheep horn bows, carbon dated between 1690 and 1730. Included are the many guns, Indian artifacts, trading goods, paintings, bronze statues, literature, and much, much more. The second weekend of July each year, the museum hosts Green River Rendezvous Days. This rendezvous is a symposium where authors, historians, and professors come together to present the history of the mountain man. Participating in this are members of the American Mountain Man Association. They are a group of individuals dedicated to the research, history, traditions, tools, and the mode of living of the trappers, the explorers, the traders, known as the mountain men. This includes academic research, of course, but it also focuses heavily on experiencing the authentic ways of the mountain man. The Museum of the Mountain Man in Pinedale is the heart of the Rocky Mountain fur trade era. They came in search of wealth and adventure. Adventure they found plenty, but wealth, well, wealth eluded all but a few. They departed just ahead of the great influx of settlers who would find their future in the opening of the American West. Settlers who would use the very trails pioneered by the mountain man. But if they have left any other mark of their presence, it was solely on the landscape of the imagination, in the wilderness where they lived and died. The testimony of the mountain is they were never here. <laughs>